Welcome back to the All Turtles Podcast, a show about the future of work, the future of health, and entrepreneurs building the future with technology like AI. I'm John C. Fuentes, co-founder of All Turtles. Today, Jessica Collier is interviewing Dr. Kyra Bobinet. Dr. Bobinet is an MD, PhD, as well as the CEO of Engaged In, a neuroscience-based design firm. She's also the author of Well-Designed Life, about the intersection of health and design. So I'm here in the studio talking to Dr. Kyra Bobinet. Kyra, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. So you have a very interesting background. You're the author of a very popular book called The Well-Designed Life, and you run a design firm called Engaged In. I'm curious to hear a little bit about your background because you were also an MD. So how does how does a medical doctor get into the business of writing books about how to design one's life? Yeah. So I had, you know, it's always the patients, right? So mm. I had I had a patient who was coming into clinic and had a gouty toe, which is very painful, big toe. Mm. And he was chatting with me and I only had 10 minutes and I was writing the prescription. It's a very straightforward case. And he's chatting with me saying, well, um, I did three meth three days ago hmm. and I haven't been asleep since, doc. And I'm thinking, okay, so meth, dehydration, gout, prescription. And, and that is not the equation that I wanted to participate in. And so I went on a, a, a quest really to figure out how else I might change the world and, and work with behavior change and ended up very focused on neuroscience and behavioral science. And then design, of course, is the most wonderful tool set for actually implementing things and creating new things. What kind of medicine were you practicing? I was in general practice okay. in Oakland, California at the time. And it sounds like you were seeing a lot of cases where maybe medicine wasn't the solution, but behavioral change might be? Yeah. I think in healthcare, it's the end of the line where you're writing prescription or you're doing a intervention or surgery. Oftentimes it's behavioral. I've, I've seen data where you know 70% of healthcare costs are basically behavior associated. And, and if we could change those health behaviors, we could actually make the biggest dent in the healthcare system and the costs for everybody. Got it. And how did you, how, what did the transition out of medicine look like? You know, I, I really was at a loss for, for a moment because there is no behavior change major or grad school or profession in a sense. It's kind of mixed up with a lot of other, you know, uh, professions. And so for me, for me, public health was the most close cousin to mm. what I was interested in. And Really, there, there's an aspect of population health um, where you're dealing with whole populations of people and figuring out what's going to work at a systems level that's, that was really right up my alley, and that's exactly where I went. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, Engaged In, right? I know that it's a firm that, or a design firm that's largely focused on behavior change. I think most people who are kind of on the design side of things, when they hear behavioral design, I think we tend to think of... Don Norman, right? Like it all, <laughs> it all comes from Don Norman. Can you talk a little bit about um, your philosophy of designing for behavior change? Yeah. So when I was an, a corporate executive at a very large healthcare company, I really used my public health degree to create scalable interventions. Um, mindfulness was one project I had. I had an algorithm that was patented. Um, I worked a lot on population health cases like diabetes, childhood obesity, heart failure, all those kinds of you know disease categories. And so what I really understood was that the brain and what's going on in the brain, whether it's you know expressed through behavioral science, behavioral psychology, or even neuroscience research, was kind of the core of what you could expect when people come in contact with a situation. And then design thinking was this way of more elegantly interpreting the science into something that could be an intervention. So I, I just naturally, when I heard uh, about behavior design and I heard about it through BJ Fogg, I was very intrigued because I thought, okay, this is the best of both worlds. This is the science with the design of making something better 
in combination. So that's mm-hmm. what that's what you know for me was inspiring about starting this company was to solve problems with that particular thing in mind. Got it. And how how exactly do you use so can you give an example of a project you've worked on with engaged in and how neuroscience comes into play? Yeah, absolutely. So right now our biggest project and, and where we're heading as a company actually is to pivot into a software company because of this project. So Walmart hired us about three years ago to design, redesign, you know, chronic condition management because they have 1.5 million employees and their families. And there's a lot of turnover in that field in retail. So they needed something very, you know, bespoke to their situation. And so we went into the field and we used design thinking to observe natural behaviors that people had every day who were associates in the stores. They were night shift. They were early morning shift. And what they did for their health was super interesting. You know, there was, there was one particular group of people. They weren't a group because they were scattered individually all over the United States. But they did one thing that was very odd, which is that they would iterate whenever they came across a challenge or wanted to make a change in their eating or in their health. So what we did was we we understood that in the brain, and we went back to the brain research, the brain has an area called the habenula. And the habenula has two functions. One is that it lights up when we think we failed. And the second thing is that it has control over my motivation. So put those two things together, and these people figured out a way to not have a habenula stop them from continuing to try, because they normally, if you think you try, if you try a new diet, for example, and then you think you failed, then your habenula lights up, then you lose motivation. Oh, and by the way, you don't even know it happened to you because it's happening subconsciously. Right. And then you just quit trying. So that was the vast majority of the people that we observed. But then there was these special people who using iteration, which means tweaking something and tinkering with it and making multiple versions of it, those people were unstoppable. Those people got lasting change. And so we basically built the software to emulate that and to teach people how to do that. Wow. So so you're you're basically trying to short circuit feelings of inadequacy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, uh, among among the many big soups of e- every version possible, right? Of of I failed, I'm a piece of crap, I'm whatever, fill in the blank. Everybody's got their own favorite to, to play in their head. Yeah, that's so interesting. So what does software look like or what is it what is the experience of using this kind of software like? Yeah, so we we basically built it as a very simple, you know, what are you going to try to do? How are you going to exactly try it as your experiment? And then why is this important to you? And we find that that's elemental, that that's kind of the the DNA of anything that you might try to do differently uh, with some sort of goal or aspiration in mind. And by doing that, we, we focus people on practice. And then what we say is, it doesn't matter if the practice works or not, either way you win because you either learn what doesn't work for you or you figure out something that's going to work for a little while and then you ride that wave knowing that eventually you'll have to iterate because something will change. Either you'll get better, you'll get stronger, you'll want more challenge, or you'll get bored or you'll move or something happens, right? Yeah. So setting that expectation, we were able to study the effects of this software back in Q2 of this year. And we actually found that this approach helped people to lose weight at the same rate as any other program but without all the calorie counting, without all the tracking, without all the shame and and feeling bad about themselves and, and just adopting this mindset. Wow. This is so interesting because it seems like um, it really does continue to converge on health-related issues, right? which is mm-hmm. your background as a medical professional. Right. How do you, do you see the future of health moving more towards behavioral change and um, kind of away from the more structured Western medicine protocol? You know, if I were to predict in a crystal ball, two things. One is that the acute care will stay, but it'll become more and more technology enabled, right? We're already seeing that with, you know, when I went to medical school, we had to memorize everything, but now we have computers that memorize things for the doctors. So what, what does that mean? That means that the doc, the humans are now only useful 
in human to human interaction and persuasion and reassurance and helping somebody to grieve and things that are sort of emotionally intelligent, right? And so then the, the the next stage of AI is when all of the nerds and the geeks and the engineers uh, who know how to create things like AI combine with and team up with the emotionally intelligent folks and the two together can start to really scale what we currently experience in the human interactions of healthcare. Well, that's the acute care side. Then the other side of it is preventive and daily. So even if I have something of a, of a disease and I have to manage it every day, 99% of my time is not going to be in the presence of, of the healthcare system. It's going to be on my own. And so as things get more expensive, as people realize that there are you know better and worse states of their health on the line, then they become much more, and we see this that with the the public is becoming much more interested in self management tools, uh, apps to really make myself healthier, and then they just need high quality and really convenient and I think scientifically based ways to do that. I guess one thing that I'm this is making me think about is you, you mentioned that you know medical students are no longer being forced quite as much to learn things by rote. Right, that the computer. I think practicing the com- physicians aren't, mm. but medical students probably just for the sake of hazing them probably are. <laughs> Still, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what I'm curious about. Like, do you think there's <laughs> do you think there's value to laying down those neural pathways for uh, new knowledge and information, even if part of one's job requirement is no longer to be able to retrieve that information from their own brain? Oh, that's such a great question. I mean, I can be old school on that and say, absolutely, because even critical thinking and being able to assess the value of information is always a good investment in your own brain. But to be quite honest with you, the enablement that's going to come from technology, you could probably take somebody with no medical training and put them in a pretty sophisticated role in assisting another human with their health without a lot of thinking involved. And so, you know, it, it's either going to go one of two ways. I, I think the real high quality kind of self-driven medical practitioners will stick with, hey, I want to know how this thing works uh, myself. And then other people who really are just focusing on optimizing the business of healthcare for cost or, or quality reasons, uh, they, they will focus differently. They'll, they'll focus on just letting the machines do most of the work. Right, right. And so where, it sounds like you think that human empathy has probably the the biggest role for people to play in the future of health. Um, and that obviously is a, is a big factor in good design, right? Being able to empathize with um, your users or the people for whom you're building something. I'm, I'm curious about engaged ins, because when I look at it, when I look at a firm like engaged in, what it seems to me is to be like the purest form of user experience, Right. What you're actually trying to do is to help people uh, solve a problem in a way that is effective. I'm curious, how do you see this distinction between maybe user experience versus uh, behavioral design? Yeah. So I, I see it as user experience is focused on making it easy and making it comprehensible and making the intention of the technology come alive. So if my technology is for you to get through my onboarding flow, then really, really great UX is the proper tool for that. If, however, I want to influence and change your future behavior, and this is where there was a departure point where social media platforms came and everybody was fascinated with them. It was kind of the brand new toy, you know, face, early days of Facebook, early days of Instagram. And then people started to get tired of it and they started to not engage with it very often. Well, guess what? Those companies brought in a whole swath of behavioral scientists and behavior designers to try to re, like create an addiction out of the digital experience, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so, and so that's, that's a whole sort of unknown generation of influx of skill So whenever you're trying to say, hey, I want to get this person to do X, Y, and Z in the future and come back, and I'm training their brain to do this comeback thing, 
that is where behavior design excels. And that can be used for positive or negative, you know, results, as we've seen with a lot of ways in which it's, you know, being used in the world. Yeah, definitely becoming more effective at designing digital products is a double-edged sword for sure. Right. Yeah. Is there anything in particular that you're working on um, out of Engaged In right now that you want to talk about? Yeah. I mean, I I think to me that the, you know, emotional layer, I I was listening to a interview with one comedian and he was talking about how he sat in with the writers of South Park and he sat in with the writers of Pixar and kind of the great storytellers of our world. And why is that important right now? Why are all of the stories vis-a-vis the the television series and those kinds of things really the only things that are getting our attention these days? It's because of emotion. And so the main trigger in the brain that decides or determines whether you will decide to do something or not is the emotion that it evokes, whether that is loss, because loss economics is a big lever that you know people can hit, or whether that is love, like when your phone vibrates and it lights up in the area of your brain that lights up in response to a crying baby and lights up in response to love. So all of these technologies and and all of the um, emotional aspect of them is what's interesting to me right now as a designer. And so, for example, with Fresh Try, with the, the software that we're building there, we have taken a lot of time with our future roadmap to place into our features, anti-shame, de-shaming, reframing so that we can get around this habenula, this sort of failure tripwire in the brain and keep people in effort. And it's, it's a super interesting question to ask in design is how can I really take, take the user in a direction where I'm going to avoid all the pitfalls in their brain and keep them where they want to be, where they feel good about themselves. So that's, to me, you know, that would be the the ultimate in design. Wow. Yeah, definitely. If people want to find out more about your firm and what you all do, where should they go? Yeah, we, we have our homepage, engagedin.com. We also have our product page, freshtritri.com. And I would just invite people to, to check it out, see what we're making and creating. And hopefully that's inspiring. Is Fresh Try open for new users? It is. Yeah, absolutely. Great. There's a free version in the both app stores. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode in the world-class Donatella Studios in San Francisco, California. Thanks to Dr. Kyra Bobinette for joining us this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy Thompson for producing, Chris Plug for his audio expertise, Michael Rivera for our artwork, and Matt Ammerman for our theme music. On behalf of Jessica Collier, Phil Libin, and yours truly, John C. Fuentes, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening.